Chapter 21, Family-Centered Care of the Child During Illness and Hospitalization. Since you'll be starting in the hospital right away, this is where we're going to start. And I think this is actually, you know, very true, uh, except in our case it's kids, not dogs. But the parents are saying, when is he going to get well? It'd be nice to sleep in my own bed again. And they have the little mat on the floor they're sleeping in. When a child is sick, and especially when a child's hospitalized, it affects the whole family. The parents aren't sleeping, the parents are stressed. It's not just the child's illness that we're taking care of. We're taking care of the whole family. So what's some of the stressors of hospitalization for a child? Well, for a child, separation, which is also called anaclytic depression, and I've actually never heard that uh, name used other than in your text. Usually people call it separation anxiety. That is the biggest stressor, stressor for the child, though, being separated from the parent. There's three phases to separation anxiety. <clears throat> the first is the protest phase. The kids cry and scream. They cling to the parent. Those of you who have kids have experienced this, where your child's like an octopus. You get one arm off and the other three extremities are wrapped around you. You just can't get them all off. That's the protest phase. Then they go through a despair phase. They stop crying and they look depressed. They go and they pout in the corner and they make ugly faces at the parent or the caregiver or whoever. The third phase, which is really kind of the dangerous phase, and it <coughs> happens a bit later, so we're not likely to see it in hospita hospitals. This is a detachment phase, um, also known as the phase of denial. In this phase, they have become resigned to the fact that they're separated from the people they love, um, but they are not content. They'll start to play and interact again. Observers might think it looks like they're adjusting, but this is where you really get those serious attachment problems. Um, children who have some sort of attachment disorder, this is what they have. They kind of from the outside look like they're doing okay, but they're not. Because they've lost the people they love, they really don't trust loving someone else or attaching to someone else because the people they've attached to leave. And so now they're going through the motions of life but really not attached to anyone. Separation anxiety, it really occurs between the ages of 6 and 30 months. <coughs> and for children during those ages, that is the big stressor for them of being hospitalized. It's not the illness, it's not the treatments, it's parents, family, um, normal routines of home, all those things being gone. Now, during early childhood, <coughs> separation anxiety will show itself as the child won't eat well, they won't sleep well, they'll ask for the parents, they may throw tantrums, children who are school-aged, they look like they're coping better, and, and they are a little bit, but they really miss their daily routines. They like the predictability of they get up at this time in the morning, they eat this for breakfast, they get dressed, they take the bus to school. They have a very set schedule, and they don't like that schedule being just chaotic. For adolescents, what they're missing is their peers more than anything else. Here's some pictures. Uh, you can see <clears throat> the child trying to get back to mom, crying. This is that first phase, doesn't want to uh, be separated from mom. And here is the despair phase. The child is sad, lonely, doesn't really, got the doll there, but doesn't really want to play. Now another big problem for kids is loss of control. If we can increase their sense of control, we can decrease the amount of stress they're experiencing. So what does this look like for different ages? For infants, what they need is trust. Uh, if we can give consistent care and make it kind, loving, gentle, what they're used to at home, following some of their daily routines, they're going to feel a better sense of control. When they cry, they get changed and fed and held and the things that happened at home. So we want to provide consistent care to let them trust that their needs are going to be met. For toddlers, 
they're trying to develop autonomy. Um, what they really miss is those daily routines and rituals. You know, every morning I get up, I go to the bathroom, I brush my teeth, I pick my clothes. If we can kind of follow those same routines, those same rituals that they follow at home, they're going to feel a little more sense of control. Um, if they are feeling out of control, some of the things they're going to do is they're going to regress. Maybe they were off of the bottle and the diaper at home, but you put them in a hospital setting and all of a sudden that's what they want. They want a bottle and they're wetting their pants again. You get negativity. They start saying no to everything, even things they liked at home. They start having temper tantrums. We want to allow them control of their environment as much as possible. And now it's not entirely possible. So those things that they can have control of, we should offer them control. Would you like juice or milk? Well, they're only on fluid, so we can't let them pick uh, solid food. Or maybe they're only on clear liquids. Would you like juice or a popsicle? So give them control of the things they can have control of. They can wear their own clothes. Would you like to wear this shirt or that shirt? Um, so control when possible. And then avoiding the sick roll. It's easy, particularly for parents when they're scared to kind of hover and <clears throat> baby the child, start doing everything for them. We want this child to keep functioning at the level they were functioning at. So the things they can do, we want them to do. If they can brush their teeth still, they need to brush their teeth because that's something they were doing at home. If, uh, you know, just whatever they were doing at home, we want to try and push them to do the things they're capable of doing while they're sick that were part of their normal routine. Picture of how to give uh, some of that safe care to a baby um, or developing trust, looking at them, interacting with them, face to face interactions. For that uh, toddler, security can come from a transitional object, something that they had at home that's familiar. Bring that to the hospital. Favorite blanket, favorite toy, favorite clothes, whatever it is. Now with preschoolers, uh, this loss of control, um, for preschoolers, they're very egocentric. They only see things from their own perspective. Another child who's having the same thing done, who doesn't cry, that doesn't matter to them at all. They don't, they don't care. They don't, the other child's experience is not their experience. They only look at their own experience. So telling them what other children have done just doesn't matter. They also have very magical thinking and their imagination of the illness or the hospitalization is probably far worse than reality. <clears throat> They're going to just think of all sorts of crazy and ridiculous things. So we want to make sure we're giving them information that's accurate and prevent their imagination from running wild. A very common perception they have is that their illness or their hospitalization is a punishment. I lied to mom yesterday when I ate that cookie and today I'm sick so it's punishment for what I did. They have pre-operational thought which means they can't conceptualize. You can't try and explain something. You need to show it to them. It needs to be concrete. They need to be able to touch it, see it, feel it. You also um, need to give them specifics. You can't give them general information. Probably in the surgery, they'll do something like this. You know, they're going to uh, make a cut here, take out the bad part, sew it back up. You'll see these stitches that are on, you know, dolls and things that have exactly what the child will have are very good because they can see the particular and they can relate to the particular, but they can't conceptualize. They're going to open you and take out something bad. I mean, make it more specific than that. School-aged children. These guys are striving for independence and prote productivity. This is the age of being in clubs and sports, and they're very active and very productive and very proud of what they do and accomplish. It's also the age they start to really understand and be afraid of death, abandonment, and permanent injury. And boredom is just horrible for kids this age. Leaving them sitting in a bed with nothing to do um, is torture. So 
for kids this age as long as they're capable um, and there, there's no medical reason they can't we want to send them to the, cl the classroom in the morning the teacher there is great he contacts their teachers uh, gets the important work they need to do there's also a setup computerized between all of the well there's a whole um, consortium of children's hospitals who have this internet connection so they can do their class work with kids of the same age who are hospitalized and another kid somewhere else in the country. Um, it's really nice what they've got going on in the classroom. Get the kids there. They're used to going to school. Then they can go to the playroom in the afternoon. That's usually our rule. Kids who are school age, in order to go to the playroom, which is a lot of fun, they have to go to the classroom in the morning. And then make sure they are getting appropriate information. That they they want to understand what's going on. We want to make sure we're giving them accurate information. Because they will come up with things like you have to leave the band-aid on or the shot leaks out. They saw liquid go in there. Just makes sense, doesn't it? Uh, here we have a preschooler. They love playing. They love imitating things from home and it's very imaginative and creative at that age. As they get a little older, uh, mom says to have fun as long as I behave. But does that make any sense? School age kids do love being active and they're very proud of the things uh, that they're doing and have accomplished like dance or sports. 